Hey, leaders, I want to thank you for listening and for supporting our important work this past year as we grow to master leadership collectively. And as we close out 2018, here are the top 10 most listened to episodes. We look forward to continuing to add value in 2019. Enjoy. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we are speaking with Dolores Hirschman. Dolores believes that every idea needs clarity, a platform to be communicated, and a strategy to be manifested. In every idea, there is a seed for positive impact in the world. From that place, she helps what she calls ideapreneurs, which are entrepreneurs committed to an idea for impact. She leads ideapreneurs to bringing their ideas out into the world through large stages, like TEDx stages, and to communicate their ideas clearly so that they have a following the momentum, and the resources they need to realize an impact. Dolores is an internationally recognized strategist, clarity coach, TEDx organizer, speaker, and author. She has over 20 years experience helping entrepreneurs, companies, and organizations realize their potential by guiding them to clarity, to define their core idea their message and market strategies needed to reach their next level of growth. As a TEDx speaker coach, Dolores leverages the TED speaking platform to turn successful professionals into thought leaders in their field. Here is the why. She believes that educators have a responsibility to nurture and empower creative ideas in our future leaders, which are the children at school, And the more we can support these educators in being that beacon of light for the students, the better off we will all be. So welcome, Dolores Hirschman. How are you? I am doing great. Good morning, Lily. Good morning. We are so happy to have you on our podcast. And as you know, this podcast takes us on a journey to master leadership. And we want to do that today by asking you key questions. So are you ready to pour into our listeners? I am so ready. Yes, you are. (laughs) Dolores, so can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? Absolutely. So I think I've spent most of my life in a path for self-leadership first, trying to understand how can I lead towards the best version of myself and towards fulfilling what I feel is my life's work or the work that I meant to be, right? Mm -hmm. This has been a constant question for me for many, many years, almost without knowing that I wasn't alone. You know how we feel like our struggles are ours and nobody else. So for many years, I thought I was like the weird person who has this journey of, of asking myself, who am I and what am I doing here? And it wasn't until I started opening up and sharing with others my journey through when I went back to school and did coaching training about um, six years ago. So before that, I, I have a background in business and entrepreneurship. And it was through the process of really digging into my self-discovery that I realized that leadership starts with each one of us. And that as we connect with others and share our journey, we begin playing a role of leaders in our community, our world, our work, right? But many times what I've learned is people put themselves or try to master leadership on the outside before they do the work in the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's when I I was listening to some of your podcasts and you you said something about as adults, we need tools to master our fears, our self-doubt, our, our bumps in the road, right? right? Especially when you're working with younger students or when you're leading a classroom full of young minds. And many times we forget that that road of leadership, of mastering leadership, is a road of self-mastering first. 
Mm. You know, you're speaking to my heart. You said a couple of things, um, path to self-leadership. And um, you're right. Not a lot of us discover that until later, but maybe never. Some people never do. But what took you on a path towards coaching training? It was an interesting process. And I don't know if you know, but I spent one of my first clients when I became a coach was I was the main coach for a teacher mentoring program in the Springfield School District here in Massachusetts. Mm. It was a year-long program for training teachers to be peer mentors. Mm -hmm. And I was a coach in house, giving them the tools and skills for leadership and self mastery so that they could be great mentors. That's just a side note. Right. What got me into the coaching? Um, <laughs> I was guided. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was about 2011, I think. And I'm a mother of four. So for many years, I had two jobs. My main job was my children, and I had a part-time job. I built four different businesses. I ran them as I was raising my children. So I, I, there were small businesses and I kept them that way of in purpose. And it was when my youngest was full-time in school that I started understanding and getting clear that it was time for me to play bigger. It was time for me to build something bigger. And the question, and someone asked me that, what do you want? And I burst into tears. That was like my aha moment in that I was anxious. I had this feeling of wasting time or losing time because I had this hunger to play bigger and make an impact, but I had no idea what that looked like. And I had no idea where to start. And I also had no idea how to combine everything I had done to that point. I was about 38 years old at the time. I felt like I had a hodgepodge of degrees and experiences and jobs that none of them aligned or matched together, and I couldn't make a puzzle with these pieces, right? Right. And it was in that process that this went. I went for dinner, and a woman at the dinner table just used the word coaching, and I was like, what's that? <laughs> As I said, I've been in this journey of self-exploration for many years. And the fact that at 38, I had never heard the word coaching in the space of personal development was weird. Mm -hmm. But the word stayed with me. And then I went home and I researched and I started looking and digging and saying, what is coaching? Like, what, what, what are they? What do you get trained? What does it mean? And it was soon after that first spark that I committed to becoming certified. I'm an ICF accredited coach, PCC level. And I began my journey of understanding that there is an experience and a process to help myself and help others in this self-mastery of leadership. Hmm. Yeah, and I happen to believe very strongly that you can't really lead well if you don't know how to coach well. Yes. Everybody needs to have a little bit of a coach hat on them, like wear the coaching hat. So what is it that you're doing now, Dolores? So... As I evolved and came out of coaching school and I became a coach and I was an executive coach and life coach. And in that capacity, I was doing this work with the Springfield Public Schools and I was mostly in the coaching role. And one day I woke up and I said, this is great, but I am bored. This is not it. Like it's part of it, but it's not it. it. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself, and this is a lot of the work that I do right now. I asked myself, what would I do for free all day long? Mm. And the answer to that is I am passionate about ideas and I'm passionate about people turning ideas into programs and projects and products and services and movements, whatever shape they take. But going from the thinking creative process to something that exists in the world and that creates a positive impact. So as I said, I have a background in business and I have a background in entrepreneurship. So when I realized that I was only playing with half of myself as a coach, I began to integrate everything else that had happened before I became a coach, which is my business and marketing and communication side. So what I do today is I do two things. I help small businesses and entrepreneurs really turn those ideas into things, whatever the shape they take, that people can benefit from. 
And I use my coaching in the process of walking that path. Because whether you are starting a business, whether you are employed in a job or working as an educator, you always want to grow, right? right. Get to the next position, uh, raising salary, whatever it is. And what stops people from moving up or growing is whatever is happening inside, their fears, their self-doubt, their limiting beliefs. So I love, love, love bringing coaching into my conversations with my entrepreneurs or business owners and addressing what's stopping them. And then we move into the tactical or strategic side. So today I merge every aspect of me and every experience I have to help ideas come out into the world and make an impact. So this is perfect because our audience are mainly educators, entrepreneurs, and to me, educators are the most creative people on the planet, or they can be <laughs> so in the right platform and the right conversations like this. So well, you actually, let me put it this way. Good educators need to be the best salespeople. Mm. Can because, you expand on that? Yeah, because a great educator will have the capacity if they do it right, to sell each one of their students. Think of, you know, 20, 30, 40 young minds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds in a classroom. What if the person in front of them, the adult in front of them, can sell to each one of those kids their dream and their future? That through education, they can actually achieve anything they dream of. Mm. Yeah, they can influence and inspire and yeah. motivate all those beautiful things. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, how would you describe your leadership style? So, one of the things that happened when I asked myself, what would you do for free all day long, is that I started doing something for free that I still do. And it's part of my legacy and my leadership in my community. And it has affected, of course, my work as well. And is that I am the organizer of one of the biggest TEDx events here in the East Coast. Oh, wow. Awesome. So every year I put together an event for 1,200 people where we coach and invite 16 speakers to share their ideas. Again, this is part of my purpose and my mission is that to spread positive ideas that have a positive impact. And so when you ask about what is my leadership role right now, I see myself you know, there's a behind every man, there's a very strong woman, or behind every woman, there's a very strong man. Or behind every idea, there's a strong team of catalysts. Mm. So I see myself, my leadership role in this world right now is to be that support system for ideas to realize their impact. I always say I'm in service of ideas and I coach the humans to get out of the way of the idea. <laughs> I love that. That happens to be held by people. Because I really think, Lily, that we are gifted with an idea. It's a creative, inspired process. Mm -hmm. And that we can say yes or we can say no, of course, right? We know you and I probably have had tons of ideas that some we said, okay, sure, let's explore this. And some we said, you know what, that's too much work. Right. So if we're gifted with an idea and we have the courage to say yes to it, that's when the world arranges around you to allow that idea to be realized and take flight. And I like to be part of that tool that the world puts in front of this, what I call ideapreneurs, these people that hold ideas, to make sure that their idea does come full circle. I love that you said when we're gifted with an idea, because it shifts the importance that we put on it right? Um, I'm an idea kind of person. Like I get ideas all the time. <laughs> and like you said, some of them are really good. And some of them are like, Oh, my goodness, this is exhausting for me to even think about. Yeah. Um, but still, it's a gift. And I love how you connect that with how sometimes our fears can get in the way. Well, a lot of times our fears can get in the way of the idea. And how you cultivate the idea by really training the person um, and helping mm -hmm. the person. I don't know if I phrased that right, but that's, yeah, no, that's perfect. That's exactly what I do. Beautiful. It's, a, it's like a dog trainer. You know, if you ask any really good dog trainer, what do you do? Do you train dogs? And they will answer, no, no, no. I train the humans <laughs> how to speak dog. <laughs> <laughs> you get in the way a lot, don't we? <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> so, Dolores, this is great stuff. So, as a leader, which quote or quotes about leadership speak mm. to you and why? Well, I love, I love Henry Ford's quote on whether you believe you can or you can't, you are right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because our capacity to do anything in this world begins with our belief system. Mm -hmm. You know, just think of what you did, Lily. You set out to build a podcast and you started on day one and you created a little audio introducing the podcast with the intention that you had designed and then you trusted, but you also took action. You didn't let your fear stop you. And here you are two, three, I don't know how many years later, mm -hmm. still successfully doing this. Is that you believed you could do it, right? Yes. And still, I was fearful, but I pushed <laughs> forward. And that's a good point that you bring is that, you know, I get this all the time. People look at, quote unquote, successful people. And there's many definitions of that. But even, you know, people that I know that have seen me come through the last five years and my growth and they see me now and they say, oh, my God, you make it look so easy. And so they think the people who are doing it and consistently doing it and being successful, oh, they can do it because they don't have self-doubt and they don't have fears. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not it. We all have them. The difference between having them and having the fear stop you and allow them to fuel you is what differentiates people who realize their impact versus people who don't. That's absolutely right. Thank you so much for that. Now, what type of leader are you inspired by and why? I'm inspired by the everyday leader. I'm inspired by that teacher that took an extra minute with my child to give them a word of encouragement. I'm inspired by that person that helps someone else cross the street. Truly, those things, when I notice them and I try to notice them consciously, those things move me more than anything I can watch on TV or read in the newspaper. Now, you said that you watch that consciously. Mm. Tell me about that. I like to look at life in the details. And trust me, some days this doesn't happen. Some days my days are a blur and I'm in fear and I'm stressed and it, it doesn't look pretty. Right. You know, we all have those. But when I'm awake, when I'm paying attention, when I'm trying not to be a robot, I go through my days looking at the details of the day paying attention to what's in front of me. Like right now, I could be rushing into my next call, but I'm really enjoying my conversation with you mm -hmm. and really present for it. So when we are able to be in the space that we are, whatever that looks like, we actually have the opportunity to see everything that's playing out in that moment. And what's playing out, there's always beauty, you know, just look out the window and look at a leaf. And um, there's always leadership, like what I just mentioned, like the everyday leaders. And there's always love and there's always compassion. But you can't see it if you are too rushed. It's being in the moment. It's being deliberate about watching that. Now, when you say everyday leader, expand on that a little bit. What is an everyday leader? An everyday leader is that person that walks through life not looking to be recognized for what they do, but looking to look at the world or their world through a lens of love and service. There's a great TED Talk. I think it's called, um, I can't remember right now, but I'll send it to you. Drew is his first name, but it's about leadership. But he talks about lollipop moments. Oh, I saw that. Um, <laughs> Isn't that great? That's mm -hmm. what I mean by everyday leader. Here's the thing. I believe that leadership is understanding that each one of us is impacting another human being at any point of time, whether you want to or not. <laughs> whatever you're doing, wherever you are going in the world, you are having a ripple effect and you're having an impact. And leadership is owning and being aware that that is happening and being intentional in making that impact the best it can be, the most constructive, empowering it can be. 
is waking up to the fact that if we are going to go around our lives touching other people, just going food shopping or whatever, then let's wake up and make that moment a leadership moment. Make that moment a moment where you bring to the other human being a sense of ease, a sense of safety, and a sense of empowerment. I love that. Now, I imagine that our listeners are waiting to learn about the lollipop moment, and I interrupted you. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? I think that this is true. Go watch this talk. It's around the story that he tells in his talk. He was at college and he was working for a nonprofit that he was supporting. And he was standing by the line of freshmen that were coming into the school for like orientation day with their parents all stressed out, all these kids. And this guy was walking around giving people lollipops, right? And so he comes to this young girl, young adult. And he sees that this girl is really, really stressed. And she's telling her parents, mom, dad, I don't think I can do it. I really don't think I can come to college. Like, this is too much. That she was very overwhelmed by it. And he saw the situation. And so he went, he's a very funny guy, this speaker. And he went and tapped the shoulder of the freshman that was standing behind this young woman. And this was a guy and he said, hey, why don't you give this pretty lady a lollipop? So he gives this freshman guy a lollipop to give to the girl. And so he gets all red and just hands a lollipop to the young girl. And this guy looks at the young woman and says, you're not even away from home and you're already taking candy from strangers? (laughs) And everybody laughed and he walks away. And four years later or three years later, He's at the same college, and this young woman who did go to college and stay, didn't go home, taps him in the shoulder uh, because he was graduating. He was leaving um, school. And she comes to him and said, I just want you to know, we've never talked in the last three years, but I just want you to know that the moment you did that scene and she retells the scene to him, which he had forgotten, I want you to know that because of that moment, I stayed in college and it's been great. And oh, by the way, I am marrying (laughs) that guy that you told him to give me a lollipop. Oh my goodness. So here's the thing. We do things every single day, conversations, interactions, little moments that we'll forget forever. And maybe we made a huge impact. And so what he tells in the talk is brilliant, is that he's not saying, well, make sure you remember because you're that great and if you're doing an impact, remember it. He actually says, if you ever have something positive happening to you because someone was kind enough to take a moment for you, then go and recognize him and tell them so. And also know that every time you are out in the world, you're impacting people, so make it count. Don't underestimate the power that you have. So the guy is Drew Dudley, Mm -hmm. and the name of the TED Talk is Everyday Leadership. Love it. Thank you so much. A lollipop moment. We need to make sure we have many of those. Many of them. And we also (laughs) tell people about them when someone does it for us. Being grateful for those moments and telling people, you remember that day that you gave me the sweater because it was cold? I still remember that day, so thank you that actually empowers other people to keep on giving them the lollipop moment. Great. Thank you so much, Dolores. <laughs> now, what's the best advice you've ever received? That at the end of the day, especially around making decisions, you know, some people are extrovert decision makers and some people are introvert decision makers. What I mean by that is you go around and you ask a hundred people what you should do. An introvert decision maker tend to be more analytical, going inside, really tapping into their emotions and the feelings and really understanding. It's a more internal process. They don't go out into the world. But because I am an extrovert decision maker and I will ask a hundred people, what should I do? And compile all these answers and try to make sense of what other people think I should do. I once finally asked the hundred and one person and they looked at me and they said, There's nothing I can tell you that will be the right or wrong answer because you have your answer. So you can ask 100 people, but at the end of the day, when you're making a decision, 
tap into yourself, tap into your gut and your intuition. I've experienced that over and over again. And that's mm -hmm. so true. So I really appreciate the advice. Yeah, we forget that the answers are inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to have the courage. And even if we make what we perceive to be the wrong choice, it's mm -hmm. still the right choice for us because there's so much we can learn from it. Exactly. I don't really believe in mistakes. I do believe in unaligned intentions. Mm. Um, what I mean by that is that everything you do from the perspective of love and growth, even if it's something that just didn't work out the way you expected it to, mm. but if the intention was right, then it's a learning process. Mistakes are when we act without love. Whenever in my life I have truly regretted something I've done, it was not just because of the outcome I received, it because there was an aftertaste of who I was being that was just not something I wanted to be. Does that make sense? Well, absolutely. <laughs> you said it so much better than I would. I'm only on the fifth question. and I'm like, I'm so enjoying this conversation. Oh my God. I'm learning so much. And Dolores, I really appreciate the time and energy. Your intentions are certainly out of love. And so I appreciate that. Now, Dolores, I'm sure you've worked with many teams. What does it mean to you mm -hmm. to have a good team? And how do you build or sustain one? Great question. A team has many leaders because if you think about it, an optimal team has every one of them being the leaders of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And they also have an assigned group leader, someone who's really keeping the balls rolling, moving forward. Now, to have an optimal team, you have to have a group leader to be inspired leader and a leader that the team looks up to, not is afraid of. To have an effective team, you have to have a group of people who have consciously agreed to be led by someone else because they believe that they will all be better off if they align behind this leader. And in order to do that, the leader consequently has to believe that their role is not to stand in the front and tell people what to do but is to stand in the back of the room with their arms stretched and hold the people that they're responsible for the leader is actually the worst job you can have because it's the most demanding as far as responsibility and it's the most demanding as far as service meaning a good leader knows that they wake up every morning in service of their team it is so true. Leadership is probably the most difficult thing we can take on. And also the most rewarding if you're willing to take the challenge. Yes. Now, how does trust play a role here? Uh, there's no team without trust. <laughs> you cannot operate in an environment of fear. You can survive, but it's not sustainable and it's not productive and it's not leading with love. Mm -hmm. So. Trust is like air to our lungs. Without trust, none of us can function. Imagine a classroom with a bunch of students and a teacher, and there's no safe environment of trust. These children can't learn. Right. Enough research to show that when our bodies are stressed, our brain are focused on one thing, which is survival. And so when you are creating an environment, it could be a classroom or a boardroom, it doesn't matter. It's an environment where there's the too many ingredients, safety and trust are not in that environment, then it's almost like being in a capsule without oxygen. Well said and very visual. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Master Leadership at Schools podcast program will help prepare your students for any future they encounter. Teachers and students learn effective leadership and podcasting skills to create a platform that's an incubator for leadership, innovation, collaboration, and creativity. See this in action at masterleadership.org forward slash MLS and find out how to bring this to your organization. That's masterleadership.org forward slash MLS. 
Dolores, can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it has shaped your life? One that has been very recent and one that is when I was younger. So I'll start with the older one. So when I was 19 years old, I was diagnosed with pancreatic tumor. Um, by the way, I didn't say this up front. I'm from Argentina. That's where my accent is from. Argentina. Um, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> and so at 19, I was diagnosed with a pancreatic tumor. And the doctors in Argentina said there is no way we're going to operate her because we don't have a good track record of people surviving the surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a tumor. It wasn't cancer. So I wasn't in pain. I wasn't sick. It was just found by chance, literally by God chance, and they just needed to operate. And of course, I'm fine and everything went well. But what it did for me is that it was interesting. And as a 19, 20 year old, it took me a few years to really digest what had happened because I never thought my life was in danger. Like literally, I just went in like you would go for a tooth cleaning, <laughs> but the world around me did not perceive it that way. So there was a disconnect. So my parents, my siblings, my friends, you know, I'm Catholic. So there was this mass on my name and the priest kind of blessed me in case I died. And it was like all these things happening around me. And there was this kind of, in my gut, I knew I was fine. Of course, at some point I said, well, maybe they are right and I'm wrong, right? But it didn't matter to me. You know, it's almost like I realized that okay, if I die, then I fulfilled whatever I had to do here. And so how it shaped me is that when I didn't die and I went on to live a longer life and here I am, I realized that, okay, if I didn't die then, then I will die at another point because we all will. So what am I going to do with every day of my life? It made me really think that this is something that they were gifted with and there is an end whenever that happens. And all we are asked is to make the space between the bookends. One bookend is when we are born. The other bookend is when we die. What happens in the middle is what we have control of. And I said, well, what am I going to do with it? And so that's how I've lived my life. So the other challenge that I faced, and I would say challenge slash opportunity, right? About a year and a half ago, November 2016, until that point, I was growing my business. I have a consultancy coaching practice. And as I said, I'm a mother of four. My children are still home. So my day was compartmentalized, kid time and work time. And my husband worked full time in the family business. Now, November 2016, due to family problems, my husband actually all of a sudden was without a job. And at that moment, I realized that I had been preparing myself to have a bigger impact in the world and that I was playing kind of in a constrained space of time because of my responsibility as a mother. And my husband looked at me and he said, okay, I need to solve this problem. You know, I won't have a paycheck starting January. I will support your work. I will make sure that the kids are fine, you know, switch roles kind of thing. You go do what you have to do. And honestly, Lily, mm -hmm. I spent the month of December saying, I didn't mean it. I didn't really mean to play bigger. I didn't never really meant to have a bigger impact. I don't really want to work with more people. I'm fun. Mm -hmm. It was complete fear and risk. I was like a cat with the nails against, you know, when you're grabbing and you don't want to let it go. I was completely paralyzed in fear. I had been wanting this. I've always said, oh, you know, I'll grow my business and I have a bigger impact. And when the time came, you know, it was also very sad and emotional, of course. But I was playing small because I was kind of hiding behind the fact that I was a full-time mom. Mm -hmm. And so 2017, that's how you get me in a weird stage now, 2018, 2017, I had no choice because my family depended on me serving more people, having more impact, and thus growing financially, growing my business. Money is just an exchange of value. You bring value to the world, the world gives you value through money. That's it. And my family needed to pay the mortgage and pay the bills. Yeah. You know, things happen when they have to happen. I doubled my revenue in 30 days. Overall doubled my business in 2017 to meet our family's demands. And I continue to do so, but also 
I did so doubling the impact I was having in the work that I do. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am, actually. That challenge is not over. I'm still the only breadwinner. My oldest son is going to college and it's scary how we're going to, you know, face all those responsibilities. But I have a level of trust that I didn't have before. There's so many questions I do want to ask, but one of the (laughs) things that pops out at me is, you have a level of trust that you didn't have before. What shifted you? When you're put in a situation where you have no choice but to take action, you always have a choice. You could stay still and then we will be living under a tree. But, the, right. <laughs> you know, I am smarter than knowing that not taking action was not an option. Right. You take action and then something happens and then someone comes and helps you and someone listens to you and someone gives you a word of advice. I mean, there's so many angels that showed up for me. My own clients, you asked earlier, and I didn't say this, but you asked what kind of leader do I like? I love authentic leaders too. Mm-hmm. And so that's the kind of coach and leader that I am. And I was transparent with my situation with my clients and I was sharing my anxiety and my fears and my own clients were like, you've got this. You just have to work with more people and help them how you're helping me. There are words of love and encouragement and wisdom not only let me trust in myself and in the work that I do, because one thing that holds us or frees us is self-doubt, asking ourselves, am I really making a difference? Does this really work? You know, all that skepticism on ourselves can hurt us. So I started to have a deeper level of trust in myself, deeper level of trust in my work, and also deeper levels of trust that there's nothing, no challenge that we're faced with that is too large for us to handle. That we can be equipped, right? Exactly. Whether we know or not, if we have the tools, it's not about taking inventory, it's trusting that the tools will show up. Just like this podcast is showing up for your leaders is that what are the tools I need to go through this process, not around it, not skipping over, but through this little storm. And so Dolores, I'm sure a lot of leaders that are listening are wondering how to connect with you. What's the best way to do that? The best way to do that is to go to my website is mastersinclarity.com. The name of the company is Masters in Clarity because my job is to guide my clients to the clarity of message and strategy and action they need to take, but also to make them masters of their own clarity. This confusion is not knowing what to do and when we get clear, we act. And so I want to remove that, teach people how to gain their own clarity so they're never frozen. Right. And certainly, I believe that it's by divine design that we need other people to speak into our lives. So what you're doing is very important work. So thank you so much. Mastersinclarity.com. Perfect. Can you tell us about one of your greatest successes? Other than my four children. So in 2015, I was asked to lead TEDx New Bedford, which, as I mentioned, is a TEDx event that I organize here in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Now, to give you a little bit of background, we had hosted a TEDx New Bedford back in 2012 with only about 100 people in the audience and 10 or 12 speakers. And in 2015, they asked me to lead a resurgence of this event that hadn't been running for about three years. And the biggest theater in my community basically offered us to host us. Now this sounds great, except the theater can host 1,200 people. And so, you know, it's like, you never say no to a gift, but this is one of those gifts that you're like, oh boy. (laughs) Yeah, Um, you were like, yes, and then, oh snap. (laughs) Oh snap, exactly. And so we said yes, and we said yes with very shaky knees, but we pulled it together. So one of my biggest successes was standing on that stage on that day, seeing almost a thousand people in the audience with 16 speakers prepared to deliver in the backstage. Oh, by the way, with no budget. I think we spent $15,000 overall, which was probably what we collected with tickets. But that we did it simply because 
everyone in my team was answering to the question, what would you do for free all day long? And we had found a task that was aligned with their answer. And we all came together to do what we would do for free all day long and do it for others. Wow, that's powerful. And we, oh, we've done it every year since. Yeah. I love how you've aligned with TEDx because their tagline is ideas worth spreading, right? Yes. <laughs> so it's a perfect combination, a perfect partnership. Yeah. So many leaders describe themselves as lifelong learners. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you and what are you learning now? Great question. We never end learning. There's learning, intellectual learning, and there's learning on self. Whenever you think you mastered yourself, think again. There's another layer of that onion. Honestly, my biggest learning right now is focus inwards a lot. And I am learning and embracing my own fears. I am clear and I know that my work will take me to a bigger impact every year, exponentially bigger. And between you and me, not that anybody else is listening. No, between you and I, yep. <laughs> it really, truly, truly, truly scares me. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm learning is, what about it does it scare me? Mm-hmm. And what is it about my limiting beliefs that is resisting it? And what do I need to nurture or embrace or expand or actually seek help and learn to allow what is meant to happen to happen. Because when we put ourselves in the middle, as I said before, we're simply stopping something that we were called to do from realizing. And my job, whether I'm working with my clients or with myself, is to trust and know that I have what it takes and that I'll be guided. And that if I'm meant to do this work, then allow it to happen. You know, Dolores, I love the energy and the time and the intention that you have in learning yourself. How important is that for leaders to do? Ah, boy. Probably many of your listeners are leaders, and then probably many of them are also parents, right? Mm -hmm. Either way, it's the same process, is that leading or parenting is probably the most humbling experience you can ever have because to efficiently and effectively lead or parent you need to be willing and have the courage to experience your most vulnerable side Mm. and it's in that vulnerable side that growth happens and people look up to you a parent or a leader that can't be wrong a parent or a leader that can't express fear, a parent or a leader that can't be authentic or have an honest conversation, it's not parenting or leading because we are leading or parenting our human experience to another human being. And the only thing that differentiates us, you know, if you're a parent, you just have a few years ahead of that person. And if you're a leader, you probably have a little bit more experience than that person. That's it. Mm-hmm. You're still human beings and sharing the human journey is what makes us leaders or parents. Humbling. I experienced this recently. Just a difficult situation. And as a leader, the expectation is to help others, to serve others, to lead others. And I just felt, and this is God's honest truth. Mm -hmm. I just felt, well, why do I always have to be the adult here? (laughs) You know, in a very difficult situation, why do I always have to be the adult here? And why is the expectation of me to humble out? And that was an authentic response, but I did want to lead well. But it was difficult at that moment in time because I had to, how they say, eat crow or humble Mm -hmm. out. So difficult. Being humble is an important part of leadership. Yeah, and it also, as you just said, it's not easy and it's not fun. But here's the thing, and we touched on this at the beginning of our conversation. It's possible if we are clear on our intention. And if our intention is always an intention of love and growth, then it makes it easy to say, okay, I know I don't want to be humble right now. I kind of want to slap that person (laughs) or whatever, scream, right? 
but how will that grow me in love or grow this relationship in any way? So the answer to that, you say, well, you know, you shouldn't shout at that person. You should acknowledge what part of this conflict is your responsibility or acknowledge you were wrong, whatever it is that you have to do. But it is leaning into love. I was watching a movie last night. And again, I can't remember the name, but it was a beautiful movie. And it was this poor woman that was in 1930s, 1920s, and she was put in a mental asylum and her baby was stolen. And basically, she would keep telling the truth and they wouldn't listen. And years later, she's in her 80s and they're revisiting her case. She's telling her story. I mean, you see this all the time. Facts are very ephemeral. They're not set in stone. Your truth could be different from my truth, right? Right. But she said something that when the truth is spoken from a place of love, it's usually the truth. Because when there's a filter other than love, it's probably not the truth is a little bit distorted (laughs) thank you so much for that now dolores if there were something you could change in education in the u.s Mm. what would that be oh i think there's some amazing teachers out there um and i think there's a lot of people they are truly leaning into love and fulfilling their life's work i have amazing respect for teachers around the world. I think that there is this perception that more is more. And I understand the concept of support and financial support. I come from Argentina. I went to a semi-private school, so a really good school, right? You could say, compared to some people, my school was awesome. We didn't always have chalk, and we didn't always have heat in the classrooms. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it was an awesome school. What I'm saying is that fancy buildings and fancy equipment don't make or break an education. That there's more to teaching kids than having money in the bank. I know this is probably controversial because you need a budget to run an efficient school. But if every single teacher is leaning into leading and selling these kids the dream of the future, with passion and with conviction, then you're going to get great young adults out of the school system, no matter what is going on on the political side or on the budget side. Now, Dolores, That doesn't mean the other things don't need to be addressed. Understood, because even if the situation is you're not funded properly, you still have to teach those kids. Yeah, and you you still have the power to do an amazing job. The same way, like, nothing can take a parent the capacity to raise a great kid. Nothing can take a committed teacher the capacity to educate great kids. And you see examples of miracle teachers everywhere. Okay. Now, Dolores, what have you read that our listeners should read and why? Man's Search for Meaning. I love this book. It's by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychologist. He founded what's called logotherapy, which is psychological therapy based on life purpose. He survived Auschwitz concentration camp. He lost his wife, pregnant wife. And he says, and gives me chills to think about it, he basically talks about the concept, kind of similar to what I just said, that nobody can take from you the will to live and the will to serve. He says that even in the concentration camp, he could predict who was the next one to die. Obviously, everybody was dying on the conditions, barely survivable. Mm-hmm. But those that stopped fulfilling their purpose, the doctor that stopped trying to heal, the writer that stopped creating in their heads, you know, when people stop being who they're called to be, then their bodies just gave in. And so I always mention that in my work because as a coach, clients come and say, well, if all this around me changes, I'll be happy, (laughs) right? Have you ever experienced that? If I get a new husband or my kid behaves or I get a new job, then life will be great. Or if I'm like my neighbor or if I have (laughs) my neighbor, Yeah, or lose the weight or whatever, Mm -hmm. life will be awesome. And what happens? They do that sometimes and nothing changes. Our fulfillment 
which leads to happiness, I believe. Happiness is a consequence of being in a place of feeling fulfilled, feeling in purpose, and feeling at peace. That combination brings happiness. Relies on us waking up and asking ourselves, what would you do for free all day long? And go out and do exactly that. And if what you would do for free all day long is listen to people, even if you're working at Starbucks, you go and listen to people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, what you're doing is who you're being. When you're clear who you want to be and who you're called to be, then wake up and be that in whatever context or job or situation you're in. Okay, man's search for meaning. Thank you so much for that. Now, you have a lot of responsibilities. Mm-hmm. What do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? Ooh, on the days that I don't, it goes downhill. <laughs> um, my office is my sacred space, and I keep it organized, and I keep around me things that lift me up. Mm-hmm. I journal. I'm not saying I do this every day. The days that are great are the, the days that that happens. And what I mean by journal is I just put a pen to paper for three pages without judgment of what I'm writing, without filter, just stream of consciousness. And I love to be outdoors and sit in quiet space, listen to music. So I try to take a half an hour every morning to either walk outside, sit in prayer, meditation, journal, or a combination of the three. And so, you know, one of the most difficult things, especially for ed leaders, is that the hours are so long. So what advice would you give about maintaining balance? Hmm. Watching the time suckers, watching what I call the Facebook trap or the email trap or the phone trap, right? When we are distracted and we fall into any of those places where we might be lost for half an hour or 15 minutes or an hour of unproductive, busy brain work and that leaves us tired and probably not in a great frame of mind. So you want to make sure that throughout the day, you make it as focused on your work as possible so that when the day ends, you actually shut it off. I believe that evenings and weekends are for personal time and family. And I'm pretty strict about it because you cannot give what you don't have inside. And if you are a teacher or if you're a coach or you have an entrepreneur, whatever role you're playing, and you're working and supporting other people, then self-care is your number one priority. Yeah, protect the asset, right? Yeah, exactly. Great. Okay, so Dolores, if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you about leadership? Trust my intuition. That's not such an easy thing to do. What's some practicals? One of the things that helps a lot is to actually scan our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies will tell us what's going on. So if you are in a situation or you're about to make a decision or something is happening in your world, you want to check into your body first. And whenever you feel a knot in your stomach or a tightness in your chest, it means that whatever's happening in the outside is affecting you in the inside, right? That's number one. It's being aware that whatever's happening is not going to go away. It has a physical reaction. And then you can play like a game in that testing thinking process. Because sometimes if we go in a thinking place or we can write it down, it will trigger another kind of emotional response or physical response in our body, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So the first thing is to be aware of what your body is telling you. And second is to try to bring that response into the world by way of talking it out with someone or journaling. Journal is the best way to put words into what your body is feeling. And the third step is looking for signs. Many times when we're dealing with a situation or we're looking to make a decision, it's important to look at what's happening around us because it will give us clue. If our intuition says we go this way and that is added up by a sign that you should go that way, you know, look at it, trust it. Again, check in with your body. When your intuition is aligned with your action, you should feel a little bit of a sense of excitement. You can be scared, I mean, because Mm -hmm. it takes courage, 
but you won't be paralyzed, frozen, afraid. Mm. Does that make sense? Of course. And you're practicing taking risks as well. Exactly. Perfect. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners that we haven't touched on? I love your questions. They were very thorough. I think at the end of the day, Lily, is the day that your book end arrives, which we all have one, right? One day we're going to say goodbye. What do you want to leave behind? What is your aftertaste? What do you want people to say about your life? And live that way every day. Perfect. Dolores, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed our conversation. And so did I. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.